Well, good evening. Welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. The saga of Jesse Smollett entered a pretty intense new phase today. A tale of victimhood is now a tale of unimaginable hubris. Smollett stands charged with a felony for plotting his own assault from the very beginning. Tonight, we'll investigate how this happened, why it happened. We'll take a close look at Smollett's defenders who dismissed doubts about this story, doubts that any reasonable person would have had from day one, as conspiracy theories. Piers Morgan will join us, too. But first, a rundown of everything that's happened today in Chicago. And for that, we are joined by Fox's Trace Gallagher. Trace? And, Tucker, the media presence was immense for the Jussie Smollett bond hearing, but in the end, the courtroom drama could not hold a candle to what happened outside. In fact, while Smollett was sell settling up his $100,000 bond, a prosecutor from the Cook County State Attorney's Office spent 20-plus minutes detailing the entire case, including statements from the brothers who claimed Smollett staged the whole thing. Watch. Smollett stated that he wanted them to appear to attack him on the evening of January 28, 2019, near his apartment building in Streeterville. Defendant Smollett also stated he wanted the brothers to catch his attention by calling him an Empire F, Empire N. Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson, who was deferential to Smollett's initial claim, also lashed out today, saying he was offended by the actor's actions. Watch. How can an individual who's been embraced by the city of Chicago turn around and slap everyone in this city in the face by making these false claims? And as Chicago Tribune columnist John Cass points out, Chicago police solve about 17 percent of the city's thousands of homicides. Yet, even with the department's thin resources, two dozen investigators were assigned to the Smollett case. And today, Superintendent Johnson cited that. Watch. As I look out into the crowd, I just wish that the families of gun violence in this city got this much attention because that's who really deserves the amount of attention that we're giving to this particular incident. Johnson went on to say that he realizes the city of Chicago has a racial divide and that it's hard for the city and country to come together. He also wonders how this might impact future cases. Listen. My concern is that hate crimes will now publicly be met with a level of skepticism that previously didn't, occur, didn't happen. And we should note Smollett could also face federal charges for allegedly sending himself a phony threat letter containing white powder, which turned out to be Tylenol. His next court appearance, March 14th. Tucker. Trace Gallagher, thanks for that. Well, there's, there is at least one big unanswered question in the case of Jesse Smollett tonight. Why did this happen? Why would a popular actor on a network TV show, someone who's rich and successful and famous, pay people to assault him and risk going to jail in the process. Well, at a press conference in Chicago today, the police superintendent wondered the same thing. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? How could someone look at the hatred and suffering associated with that symbol and see an opportunity to manipulate that symbol to further his own public profile? Well, that's a fair question. What Smollett did was not simply illegal and weird. It was terrible for the country. So why did he do it? Well, the short answer appears to be he wanted a raise at work, and he thought this would get him that. The broader answer, the one that we should all think about, meditate on, is that Smollett was simply responding to the incentives that American society has created for him. Smollett pretended to be a victim because we reward victims. We've decided that it's more heroic to suffer than it is to achieve. That's the message of our culture, our politics, our workplaces. Jesse Smollett was simply doing his best to get ahead according to the rules that others made. And in fact, had his hoax succeeded, there is no doubt Smollett would have been richly rewarded for it. He'd probably get a significant bump in pay and an extended segment on Colbert. He would have been a hero. So, Jesse Smollett was not crazy. He knew exactly what he was doing. Faking a hate crime was an entrepreneurial move. In modern America, victimhood is power. That's why so many powerful people claim it. It's why Elizabeth Warren pretended to be an American Indian. It's why at every low point during the entire span of his political career, Barack Obama invoked bias. It's why so many politicians do the same today. 
I have suffered. You cannot criticize me. The academic left has constructed an entire theology around the holiness of victimhood. It's called intersectionality. It comes with an elaborate rating system in which every group in America is assessed according to how much it has suffered. The more your group says it has been discriminated against, the more moral authority you receive. It's a pretty good deal for a lot of people, and they have no interest in changing it. And that explains why so many on the left initially jumped to Jussie Smollett's defense. They weren't simply defending him. They were defending identity politics. We could give you any number of examples of this, but we'll skip ahead to the most nauseating one of all. Watch anchor Robin Roberts of ABC, quote, News, beam with joy after Smollett finishes the most dishonest performance of his life and then tell him his lies are beautiful. I still want to believe with everything that has happened that there's something called justice. Because if I stop believing that, then what's it all for? Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Well, before he claimed that white supremacists beat him up on the street, most people had never heard of Jesse Smollett. And after he became a victim, everybody wanted to be his friend. Here's Don Lamont over on CNN bragging about how he texts his new pal Jesse every single day. He's got Jesse's cell number. That's how close they are. Really tight. My concern is for him. Right, yeah. right. And for his well-being. Every day, I say, I know you think I'm annoying. I can show you a text. I know you think I'm annoying you, but I just want to well, know no, that you're you doing, oh, okay. that you're okay. Yeah. If you need somebody, you can talk to me, because there's not a lot not of us, of us. Out there. Yeah. Right. Yep. Sometimes he responds, sometimes he doesn't. He responds and says, you are not annoying. You can talk to me, Don Lamont says, because there aren't a lot of us out there. Well, here's the translation. Us means people who've been oppressed in the ways that Jesse Smollett has been oppressed. Lamont is letting you know that he's in that group, too. Yes, he's a highly paid news anchor with his own TV show. And yet, like Jussie Smollett, Don Lamont is a holy victim. So there's a mad scramble over who's the victim here. Who is the victim? Well, there is one. What Smollett did was not a victimless crime. There's no such thing as that. An entire group of people did get slandered by this hoax. Regular people from outside the coastal cities. People with the wrong political beliefs and the wrong skin color. Smollett and his many defenders savagely attacked these people and are not apologizing for doing it. Instead, they're telling you, you hear this everywhere, that the real losers here are the authentic victims of hate crimes who won't be believed the next time. Okay, that's fine. But what about the innocent Americans they just poured venom on for two weeks because it matched some bigoted stereotype they had about middle America? What about them? There's no mention of them. Donald Lamont would very much like to keep up those attacks on those people. Attacking them allows him to feel oppressed. That is why when Smollett was finally caught, Lamont reacted in a very puzzling way. He didn't seem especially concerned that his buddy had lied to further divide the country to hurt America, which he did. No, that wasn't the real problem. The real problem, according to Don Lamont, is that Smollett's arrest might discredit the cult of victimhood. This is playing out every single moment yeah. in cable news. Sean Hannity's going to eat Jesse Smollett's lunch every single second. Tucker Carlson is going to eat Jesse Smollett's lunch every single second. Yeah. Because when you tell the truth about a hate hoax, you're the real hater. What's the cost of this attitude so floridly on display to our society? What does it do to us? Well, think of it this way. What would happen to your kids if you woke them up every morning by telling them that they were victims? No matter how hard they worked, people would always hate them just for who they are. What if you did that? Would that be good parenting? Would it make your kids stronger, happier, more successful? No, it wouldn't. And good parents would never do that. Good parents tell their kids to take responsibility for their lives, not to blame others, to work as hard as they can to overcome obstacles. That's what good parents of all races and all backgrounds tell their kids. And if you don't believe it, just ask 10 well-adjusted, accomplished people if their parents allowed them to feel like victims. Again, it doesn't matter where they're from or what they look like. Ask them, did your parents tell you you're a victim? And not one of them will say yes. And yet we tell our citizens just the opposite. And you see the effects very clearly in the workplace, for example. In the years after the 2008 recession, there was an enormous surge of claims of workplace bias of all kinds. There is still no evidence that bigotry itself increased at all during those years. And yet when people felt threatened by a teetering economy, they knew that claiming victimhood status would give them an advantage. Can you blame them? No, you really can't. Not really. They didn't write the rules of our society. They're just following the rules that people like Don Lamont wrote. 
but at great cost. Piers 